Good morning again, and welcome to the discussion harnessing uh, urbanization for growth and shared crops in Africa. It's a, it's a very exciting topic, a very topical. My name is Ani Das Gupta. I'm the director for uh, WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities at WRI. I used to be here, and it's great to be back. Um, it, I'm very excited to be moderating this. Uh, there's a lot of discussion going on. The panel, you will see that Africa has a huge opportunity it's urbanized, urbanization right now is relatively low compared to other regions in the world. It's about 40%. We compared to regions in Asia, which is more than 50%, or Latin America, more than 60%. So the question is, what will happen? What will this transformation of Africa, what decision, what choices will people make? Will Africa grow, will learn from other, other regions, or make the same mistakes? So that's the question in, in front. It's a huge trans transformation coming to Africa. And what choices, and what does the evidence telling us that allow us to make good choices? So we have a fantastic panel. The way we have organized this panel is in three parts. We have three experts from the World Bank speaking about the recent evidence they have collected. I'll introduce them in a minute. Then we have three terrific guests who work on the ground, who are here to comment on our work and their, their view of how what should happen next. And then I would very much like to have, I hope we have some time to open up, because I'm sure you have a lot of questions to ask both the panel and our guests. Before we do that, I'd just like to thank, take the opportunity to thank DFID, who's supporting this groundbreaking work using satellite data and things that you will see in a minute, and Cities Alliance, I saw Billy somewhere, for uh, making this event happen. Um, I also like to welcome our online um, audience. This event being streamed all over the world, uh, in English and in French, and uh, the Twitter handle is uh, Africa Growth Share, and you can use that to ask questions. But before we do that, I would like to invite uh, Mahta Job, our Vice President from Africa. I personally know this is a topic very dear to him and to welcome our guests and also introduce the topic. Magda. So, Annie, it's so good to see you again. And uh, uh, taking somebody from the bank is good. He looks uh, uh, 10 years younger than he was before. <laughs> so, uh, so I should maybe emulate him at some point. Uh, and it is just uh, so great to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a nightmare for my colleagues because they pre prepare for me uh, opening remarks and I usually don't stick to it. So I apologize to my colleagues who took so much time to try. But I just thought that uh, experts who will be in this panel will be able to talk more intelligently than I will do about uh, uh, urban challenges. And I will let them to talk about the trends, about the issues. I just want to, to say a few words about uh, what it means for me. But before that, I'm delighted to see really a, a, huge, a great panel here. People where I, I worked with uh, in a previous life, uh, uh, Minister Kituyi, which was a, 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 a colleague, not a colleague, uh, a, a client of mine when I was country director in Kenya, and he was leading all the negotiation for the Africa Group on, uh, on trade at that time. So uh, it's good to see you again, uh, uh, Minister Kituyi. Uh, the minister from, uh, from Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Abdurrahman Sisse, who was coming with uh, such a great experience from the private sector before coming and joining public sector and bringing uh, all his wisdom uh, to, to, to us and he was doing a great job. Uh, in Geneva, we're talking about some of the challenges of urban uh, uh, development in Africa in a panel. Uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Bassi, who is the Secretary General of United Cities and local government, will tell us a lot about the challenges and uh, 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 luckily, I'm speaking before Paul Collier, so I will not look so bad, because uh, talking of, speaking after Paul is always a challenge. I don't need to introduce him. You all know him. He's a great uh, uh, scholar working on Africa and uh, in many, many areas. And I have uh, my two colleagues, uh, Eddie, who is heading the city, the city is urban. He has a very long title. He covers a lot of sectors, but uh, he's, a, he's a training and he's a, he's a roots are really in urban in urban, so you have someone who will be tell us a lot. And uh, we worked together in Latin America as well as Marianne Fay before she moved uh, to be the climate change uh, uh, chief economist, has been most of her career, I think, working on urban issues. So we have a great panel, 
so I didn't make this presentation to eat on my presentation time. I just wanted to make sure that you know the quality of the panel that we have. Let me, I would like to make a three, four points quickly. Uh, Africa is a, is a region in the world where you have the fastest growth in, in cities. You know, so it's just uh, at a pace which is a pace which is uh, 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 un, un, unprecedented. And uh, we have at the same time one of the highest population growth. So the combination of both means that our city will uh, really increase very, very fast in Africa. So one of the challenge is uh, uh, the economic literature tells us that uh, there is a benefit of agglomeration. You increase productivity because knowledge and technology and science is shared in better conditions. But uh, it's like a uh, uh, demographic transition. You're reaping, you're reaping the benefit if you do the right thing. It's not because you have it that it will, it will do the good things. If you have agglomeration and you don't have a minimum of conditions to create this exchange of knowledge, this sharing uh, this, uh, of technology and creating this agglomeration effect that we all hope, you will not have, you will not reap the benefits. And I think this is a challenge that we're facing now in African urbanization. Our, our cities are growing in a very anarchic ways. You have slums which are building up, people are migrating. Uh, at a very high pace in, in our cities, and uh, all countries are starting uh, 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 being uh, really uh, facing those challenges and are struggling in, uh, in, in addressing them. At the same time, there is a pressure from the society which wants much more decentralized mechanism in policy making. And uh, Kenya is a good example. Uh, uh, since the BOMAS, by the time I was in, in, in Kenya, took a long process where there were a willingness to have much more empowerment of people at the local government. So there is a pressure of the societies of our countries to say we want the local government to be much more involved in the policy making, to be the center, the nerve of policy making and service delivery. And at the same time, you don't have really a, 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 a clear ability to handle that large flux of people to cities. So this is for, for me one of the, of the big challenges. So it, it raises uh, a certain number of questions. One of them is the capacity of local government. Uh, 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 what is the structure of local government? And without offending anybody, it's clear that the lower you go at the level of decentralization, less you have capacity to implement. Usually, the, the ministry in, in the capital city has the one who are more endowed with human capital. You go down to the city level, you go down to, uh, 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 to the uh, local government, you find less capacity. So how to meet that challenge is one big question for me of capacity when you have higher devolution in, 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 in cities. Secondly, do we want to reopen the old question of city planning? Uh, at some point, we had decided at the banks that we put much less emphasis on this question. It was a little bit older question. It's like the role of the state in the economic development. We, we were thinking that, you know, if you have price rights, uh, things will, will fall. Uh, uh, in, he, and we learned that it was a bit more complex. And I do think that at the time we left a little bit uh, city planning, we might want to start thinking again about it. Third is what is the governance around cities which will allow to, to people not to have the Kibera of this world, but to have a places where people can still access the, the place they are working and they, were, uh, they, they, they get jobs without having to be, to be, to be, to be, to be uh, concentrated in the places where you have suboptimal uh, de service delivery, but which are closer to the, the, the way where they can generate jobs. And this is all this issue of urban transport, of uh, housing, etc. So what I'm saying uh, uh, in, in, in summary is that uh, 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 as we move in this ag agenda, it will be also the challenge for us to move from interventions where you're thinking about building a sewage plant, financing a a rapid bus transit uh, 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 process, do a project of housing to start engaging with local government in, as entities which have a global program which is articulating all these and we discuss the externalities. And in that context, it, it, would, it would be very important, I remember, I think that you were involved in that, WDR, where the discussion was about what is mean secondary cities. And as we talk about uh, uh, a higher urbanization, what it means in terms of uh, the rural space. Not only talking about agriculture, but I'll talk about secondary cities, which could be also another way of increasing the productivity in the rural space, which has been pretty flat in Africa. So I'm raising more questions that I am uh, really answering any because I don't know anything. 
So I'm here to listen to the expert to, to answer those questions. But I think those are the questions which are, are really a uh, 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 thing. And I think Paul will tell you a little bit more about uh, the work that we are starting with the FID. But we raised some, some questions, and if I may sum up by talking about uh, the typology. We have countries, uh, we have cities which are already large, large, and maybe we need to see how to can retrofit some of the policies which have been put in place which are not yielding to the best result, uh, the mega cities. We have cities which are growing, so let's avoid that they are making the mistake of the large cities, and it's like Marianne will tell us uh, 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 when countries are growing to make sure that they have a green growth path instead of let them uh, have a growth which is not a, a green growth. The same thing in cities, they make sure that cities grow in a way which is not creating another large city which are not well organized in Africa. And third, to think how uh, the, 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 the special dimension of, of, of uh, economic uh, policy making is much more integrated in what we are doing in Africa because we are so far not fully integrated the spatial dimension of our work. So I just wanted to say with you word and thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity to say this introductory work. But the panel that you have in front of you will, uh, is the best panel I think we can get today to talk about issues of urban development in Africa. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much uh, for setting us up, asking us difficult questions, but also what you said about urban planning. Uh, way to go. Uh, Mark has actually introduced the panel already, so I want to take to our mind. We have three, uh, three uh, member, uh, three presentations. They promise to be very concise and tight, so if they go over seven minutes, start clapping. Um, first, Ede, let me just introduce all three Ede, so I won't interrupt the flow. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot. We actually have a terrific video to share with you about what people of Africa are saying about cities. And it's just a minute, few minutes, so let's just see this quickly. So, oh, you need this. Bana hili jiji bana, ni hili la malaha kwanza. Kiti ya kwanza, ukiangalia maswala ya bali, nichi, ukiangalia magorofa, ya basi, majisikia laha. Jiji la jaa, la daa, kitu ambacho nacho kipenda zaidi. Kitu ambacho sikipendi kusuda moja ni uchafu. Ah, kusimambo ya maji tu. Kuna ishu moja ambo na tatiza sana ishu labda ya usafiri. Kwa mfalo kama sisi. Kero ya kwanza ambayo mtu ya yote na kuja dada salamu wanaipata. Hasa kwa mimi naeza ni kasema ni mipango miji ya ijaka sawa. Kama mimi ninge kukua ni kiongozi. Nile jitaidi kadi ya wezo angu kwa kisho kwa mba maino ambayo ya na matatizo kama ayo. Kitu ambacho ninge, yani ninge pewa madalaka. Nige kifanya katika jiji hili. Kwanza nige anzisha ya ni kampeni kubwa ya usafi. Kwa sababu mungi unanuka. Kitu ambacho sikipendi Dar es Salaam ni shida ya maji na umeme. Keo yangu kubwa ni mfumo wa majitaka. Sisi kakuficha ya ni foleni. Kwa kumi foleni ndo tabwe. Thank you. Um, it, it would look like a setup, but this is actually being made by a separate entity parallelly. But if you can see the topics, they're very consistent with what you hear about transport, solid waste, housing. Let me um, introduce the panel. Um, we have Edezas first, uh, whom all of you know, uh, leads our work in urban, rural, social, and disaster uh, management, followed by warm welcome to Professor Collier. Glad, glad to have you back here. Uh, you know, talk about uh, about banking on urbanization. And finally, we have Marion Fay, who's done a lot of work on this, on green climate, and now is the uh, chief economist of our climate team. And she's going to talk about housing and its relation to it. So, Eddie, let's get started with you. And uh, let me welcome uh, all of you. Uh, when uh, we began thinking about this topic on urbanization in Africa, we would never think that we would have a full room uh, today. So this uh, is proof that this is a, a really important topic uh, for the continent altogether. And as I lead the, uh, the uh, a practice that looks at urban development and social development together, I keep repeating that cities is not only about infrastructure, services, uh, transport, wastewater. 
it is also about people. And I always start my stories with people. And this is Fatma. Fatma uh, came to uh, Dar es Salaam in 1988 uh, together with uh, his uh, husband, Peter, uh, looking for jobs. And this and a, and a better future for their family altogether. And uh, Peter now works uh, in the construction industry as a mason. Some days he gets uh, a job in a day, some days he doesn't. They, uh, to be close to the jobs, they live in Tendale, uh, which is one of the largest slums in Dar es Salaam. And it is close where the jobs are, but it is also where the services are not. And uh, water runs, uh, you would see through the slum uh, next to the solid waste, and it's the same water that is uh, used for cooking, for washing. The open uh, toilet and defecation is right there. And then uh, Fatima struggles like the bottom 40% uh, of uh, Tanzania. It is uh, really 80% of their income uh, is for food. Uh, they at most can use 2% for transportation. Walking is an integral part of uh, their daily life. And, and it, is, it is that combination of being close to jobs, but it is facing the difficulties of services, facing the difficulty of transportation that we want to talk to you about today. And the main message of this presentation is that Africa needs to build cities that work, and Africa has a unique opportunity to do so. 472 million people today, but as soon as you start moving in 2025, 659 million people, another Nigeria coming. And then by 2040, the population will be a billion, double in the next 25 years, in the next generation. So Africa, the opportunity that Africa has is to get the urbanization right. This is the time that is happening, but the challenge is that cities are growing very fast. But when we start comparing the cities today in Africa, the urbanization rate, the challenge is that the continent is getting urbanized at a much lower income level when we compare to other regions. So Latin America crossed the 30%, 40% urbanization that Africa has today when in the 1950s when uh, income at that time was uh, 1,860. The Middle East crossed that uh, threshold in uh, 1968 with $1,800 per capita. East Asia and Pacific co crossed the threshold in 1994 with uh, 3,600. Africa is crossing the threshold at about $1,000 per capita. And therefore, the ability of resources is much less than in other regions, and therefore, every dollar of investment counts in cities. Now, what we are also seeing is that cities are growing, but manufacturing tends to be declining. As you will see in the vertical axis, manufacturing as per, per, uh, value added as percentage of GDP in 1975 it was around 20%. In 2013, it has gone down to around 10. As the urbanization goes, the cities are growing, but manufacturing is declining. And that's a really important part of the question. Where are the jobs? Now, the other fact that we're beginning to see is that cities are growing, but the population is sprawling. On the left-hand side, we see Bangkok in 1988. And you see uh, from the city center how many kilometers the population is distributed. Very dense at the core of the center. Now let's take a look at uh, what happened in Dar es Salaam in 1988, 2002, 2012. The center of the, the town is not the most dense part of the population. The sprawling, and we will see in a couple of slides, it's very important. The sprawling that we see in cities in Africa is exploding, and therefore it is the time to start trying to control that process altogether. We are very excited to share with you a couple of uh, data, uh, satellite data and analysis that is coming out of that. Africa, 2 o'clock in the morning. Satellite data is beginning to allow us to understand the lack of infrastructure density. So if we have in the vertical axis the light or infrastructure to population ratio, then for middle size, uh, for some of the capitals around cities, from Maputo to Kampala to Dar es Salaam, you begin to see that there's a long way ahead in terms of infrastructure needs to cities of comparable size. And as Magda was saying, the large cities, the mega cities, the Kinshasa and the Lagos, have similar way of challenges into this process. And we are now able to use nighttime data, nighttime light information, to analyze with a much greater detail what is happening with the growth of cities uh, from uh, space. Now, when you look at Africa by day, the satellite data now allows us to identify with much better precision the land use, whether it is commercial and industrial, whether it is dense residential, whether it is shanty towns. And therefore, you begin to see cities like uh, Dar es Salaam and Kigali, and the main message that we want to say here, what we're beginning to understand with this satellite data, is that commercial and industrial land is missing in the city center. It is dispersed all around. You would see on the right-hand side, Kigali is all over the map. The purple 
uh, colors is showing the industrial and commercial. There is not an industrial and commercial center that allows to concentrate the jobs into this process. Now, where are the jobs in the city? And this is for different cities around the world. This shows you the share of industrial and commercial land as percentage of total land, 23% in Ho Chi Minh City, 6% in Nairobi, 1% in Addis. So much to be done into this process of figuring out what to do in terms of the concentration and the location of the jobs. Now, the question is, how do people get to these jobs? And in Nairobi, 70% of the population either walk or they take the Matutu to work. Okay, so if 40% of the population walk, and therefore in 60 minutes of walking, they are only able to reach 8% of the jobs. Now, if you take the Matatu, 28% of the people can afford to take Matatu, but they are only able to reach within 60 minutes of commuting 14% of the jobs. And therefore, it's really difficult. You really need to live very close to the jobs because those are the restrictions that you have in terms of transportation. So access to those opportunities is critical and important. And therefore, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, the solution is Africa needs to build cities that work, cities where the jobs are concentrated, the cities where housing, uh, it is not far from them, that it, and very important links of transportation from where people live to where they can work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ede. Thanks very much. Um, Africa's had a, an easy decade. Um, you've been, you benefited from the super cycle, and unfortunately, that super cycle is over. And so you're at a turning point, not necessarily an easy one. Um, during the super cycle, you got easy growth, you got easy revenues from resource rents. Where is that growth and e revenues going to come from in the next decade? And it's not going to become coming from the super cycle. That's over. What I'm going to be suggesting is that that, that can be replaced by effective urbanization. Um, as you've heard, Africa is the least urbanized. It's the most rapidly urbanizing continent. Urbanization has huge potential, but it has to be managed. It's not automatic. Urbanization can deliver rapid growth because the miracle of productivity, which we'll come to in a moment, happens in cities. And so you can get a decade of growth through rising productivity. You can also get a decade of big rents, not from natural resources, but from the growth of cities. Because as cities grow, as they become productive, the value of the land on which they're built rises a lot. And, uh, sorry, we was, oh, I'm supposed to click this? Can somebody, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is supposed to sing along with me. Um, let's keep, let's get to the rising land values. And here's the rising land values in one of Africa's big cities, Nairobi. It's land values since 2007. And amazingly, the average value of a, of a square acre or whatever hectare in, in uh, Nairobi has increased by 535% in just seven years. That's rents like natural resource rents. As with natural resources, rents are a great thing to tax. Taxing them is non-distortionary, and it's fair because the owners don't get that appreciation as a result of any activity that they've done. Huh? It's other people coordinating around them that drives up land values. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to tax. But you need to build a tax system that actually captures that land appreciation. And at the moment, you haven't got that tax system. And so it has to be built. So that's the opportunity. Um, Productive cities, however, depend upon three distinct processes of investment all happening together. Infrastructure, housing, and commercial industrial. Where they happen together, you get a triple miracle of productivity. And let me describe that triple miracle. 
firms, by clustering together, reap scale economies that are above the level of the individual firm. The scale economies and specialization occurs at the level of the cluster. So that's one part of the miracle that cities do for productivity. The second part is by clustering households together, living close together, you cluster demand. And by clustering demand, you create a lot of job opportunities. And servicing those, that demand is itself a miracle of productivity. And the third miracle of productivity is bringing workers close to job opportunities. And if you get enough workers close to enough job opportunities, workers are all subtly differentiated in their abilities. And employment opportunities are all subtly different in their needs. And that's what a labor market does. It matches characteristics of workers to needs of firms. But you need to have a dense proximity of workers to firms in order to facilitate that. Um, how do you get those three processes happening at once? They're made by different people. Government does infrastructure, households does housing, and firms do commercial and industrial. So there's a need for the government to facilitate and coordinate the housing investment made by households and the commercial and industrial investment made by firms. What is the coordinating mechanism? It's infrastructure. Infrastructure obviously facilitates, but it also coordinates. Now, you might think that just having a, an urban plan would be enough to coordinate. It isn't. A lot of plans never come to fruition, and so they're not sufficiently credible. The great advantage of early infrastructure is that it's irreversible. It's there, it's a credible commitment. It's also visible to everybody. And that creates what is known as common knowledge. Not only do I know it, I know that you know it. Turns out that common knowledge is the key ingredient to coordination. Not only is early infrastructure facilitating and coordinating, it's cheaper than doing infrastructure late. It's costly to retrofit infrastructure once people are settled. And so there's a sensible sequence and a disastrous sequence. Getting it right looks like that. You put the infrastructure in, and then people invest in housing. Getting it wrong, I'm afraid, looks like Africa. You get settlement before infrastructure, and then it's too expensive to do the infrastructure. As a consequence of that, what Africa's got at the moment is, unfortunately, cities that are not good platforms for breaking in to global production. Your cities are not global producers. Right? What are they? They're artisan cities. What do I mean by that? People work typically in small enterprises, in informal conditions, with poor infrastructure. And what that spells is low productivity. Yeah. In fact, it, if you wanted a single image of what an African city looks like, it's people who've come from the villages and are then just squashed up peasants. Yeah. The fundamental modes of production haven't changed. Yeah. Because of that, enterprises competing on global markets could not survive because they'd be competing with enterprises based in a Chinese city or Istanbul or something where you've got uh, uh, the infrastructure and the density that makes production much more efficient. So what's the challenge going forward? It's to build cities that become platforms for global production. How do you do that? The key concept that I want to leave you, you, you with is livable density. That's what you should be building, livable density. What does livable density look like? It's three manifestations. One is it's zones where firms can cluster together. You looked at that picture of Kigali. The, 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 the enterprises were dispersed all over the city. 
you haven't got zones where firms can cluster together and benefit from that localized scale. Right? Clusters of people. What do clusters of people look like in a, an African city? What should they look like? Something like this, about a five-story apartment block. The one thing that's wrong with this is the ground floor, because if you put dense demand together, uh, the ground floor can be small enterprises providing jobs. Right? So that's what density, that's what livable density looks like in housing. And then finally, proximity of workers to firms, what does that look like? It looks like rapid transit, rapid bus transit. Livable density provides the, uh, the basis of a virtuous circle in which productivity is rising, and because productivity is rising, job opportunities are increasing. And at some stage, you break in big time into global markets, and then you get the sort of triumph that East Asia had. That's the challenge. You won't achieve it by business as usual. Um, as uh, as Maktar said, um, I and Tony Venables, who's also here, are part of really a very big research project that's recently been launched on urbanization in Africa. Um, we're doing a presentation at the request of the Ethiopian government in July to explain you know, what we think the, the research project is coming up with and its implications for policy in Addis. Uh, we'd be happy to do that anywhere. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Paul. Marianne. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here and great to be back in this topic of urbanization and infrastructure. And what I was asked to do today uh, by the colleagues uh, was to talk to you about how to uh, foster this uh, resilient urban transition in Africa. And you know, being the, the climate change chief economist, I of course had to stick in uh, the resilient in there. But I, I also think that it, it is a really important thing. I think as we've heard before, one of the things that we've learned in urban economics and in studies of urbanization over, over time, over history, is that urbanization creates lots of opportunities, but it can also create a lot of lock-in. Decisions that are made today uh, in urbanization in Africa are going to have consequences a very long time into the future. The city planners of Atlanta today are struggling with the fact that they have a very low density city. And those were decisions that were taken over 100 years ago in some, some cities, or in the case of Atlanta, even a little more recently. But it's very hard to retrofit. So the resilience is important because this is what is being created today or not created today. And it's resilience towards the, future, the economy of the future, but also resilience towards climate change and climate change policies that could bring in a very different set of economic incentives in the future. So the big message of this presentation and of, of the work that Shomik and colleagues are doing is that what we really need for productive and sustainable cities is coordinated action across the three pillars that Professor Collier has mentioned, which is housing, infrastructure, and jobs. And let me start with jobs. 15 years ago, when, when colleagues and I were working on urbanization in Africa, we looked at scatter plots of urbanization in Africa, and, and we concluded that Africa was different because it was the one region in the world that was urbanizing without growth. But what we were looking at is, is the first two points in this data, uh, in, in this graph, where you see, for example, from 92 to 97, you had urbanization that was ha happening without eliminating poverty. And what you've seen in the subsequent two decades is, is what Professor Collier was referring to as you know, taking advantage of, of an overall very uh, favorable uh, economic environment. And what you see is substantial decline in urbanization in Africa, so, so in poverty in Africa. So urbanization has contributed to this reduction in poverty over the last 20 years. But what urbanization has not done for Africa is to permit a structural transformation. And today in Africa, still a very vast majority of the jobs are in the informal sector. In fact, 60% of jobs are still in household enterprises. 
Now, these household enterprises and this informal sector is extremely varied. You've got the survivalists that are mostly petty traders, but you've got also firms that have potential for a lot more if they're enabled to move up the value chain and, and, and actually grow and possibly become formal sector firms. So policies need to build on this. Policies need to both help the existing informal sector, but also enable them to possibly grow up and grow into something very different and much bigger. And this includes support and coordination with, for these firms, a number of steps that are absolutely required for regulation, and then the kind of planning and investments that we've, we've talked about earlier. What about housing? Um, there again, African cities are different. 70% of Africa's urban population lives in urban, uh, in informal settlements, and that is a much higher share of informality than you would find in other regions in the world. And that causes tremendous amounts of vulnerability because one of the things that we know is that urban um, uh, slum population tend to be at much greater risk of natural disasters, not only because they're less served by services or they have houses of lower quality, but they tend to locate in the most undesirable area, in the most exposed area. So these are pictures, uh, maps from Dakar, which shows that a very large share of the population that settled, that came to Dakar, in the, the, in the last 20 years, settled in the most flood-prone areas of Dakar, so that today 40% of that population is at risk of flood, and this is only worsening with the sea level rise that has been happening fairly rapidly on, on the Atlantic coast, and particularly around West Africa. Now, why such rate of informality? Well, because housing in Africa is characterized by very low affordability. There's a striking example from Addis Ababa where you can see that you've got to be in the top 1% of income in order to be able to afford a complete house. Even in Ghana, where the situation is much better, you've got to be in the top 20% in order to uh, afford a finished house. And this is due not to something that's unmovable and changeable. This is entirely due to market and regulatory failures and weaknesses. Land market uh, and planning, for example, Mokhtar called upon us to, to go back to planning. And one of the things that we know is that in many African countries, planning regulations are not at all appropriate for the generation of affordable housing with things like minimum plot sizes that are far too high. Then there's a high industry cost due in part to regulation, but also to markets that are not well functioning. A striking example is that a 50 kilo bag of cement in Nigeria is twice as much as it costs here in the United States. And then finally, there's extremely low access to finance, which makes it difficult for people of relatively low income to access housing. So what are the implications for policy? Number one, measures to reduce the cost of housing. And that includes improving city planning, but it also includes uh, working with the industry to reduce costs as well as, uh, as uh, strengthen, uh, investing in infrastructure and subsidizing uh, slum upgrading. But it also requires increasing uh, support to the bottom 70% of the population, notably by improving access to housing finance. Now, let's turn to infrastructure. There again, um, we see that in Africa, African cities, infrastructure is not keeping up with urbanization. So the bottom two lines of this graph is showing you that as Africa urbanized, access to services were in fact declining. This is the particular example of access to water, but we could have taken a number of other examples. And as a result, not only is Africa not catching up with richer regions such as Latin America, it is also not even keeping up with other relatively poor regions such as South Asia. And now, I wanted to give you one example of the kind of vulnerabilities that this lack of infrastructure is creating. This is Nouakchott, an aerial photography of Nouakchott. Now, I don't know how many of you know this, but Nouakchott is actually located beneath sea level, about 50 centimeters beneath sea level. And a very worrying fact is that the sea is getting closer to Nouakchott at a rate of 25 meters per year. Now, what is causing this? Number one, the port that has been put in Nouakchott and the way it has been built has been done in such a way that it is actually increasing the, the, the wave patterns and the current patterns along the coast and increasing erosion. 
A second issue, which is that just as sea level rise is actually increasing the, the, the in contributing to a rise of water under Nouakchott, there's also been a real problem with a lack of drainage and with an antiquated uh, water system that's leaking tremendous amount of water that's pumped out of the Senegal River and into Nouakchott. So Nouakchott has had a really chronic problem with, uh, with flooding. And then a final thing that, that goes back to the problem of informality is in, in the past decades, as climate change has, has made uh, life in the countryside unsustainable and manageable for a lot of people, and they've moved, there's been a tremendous rural urban migration in Nouakchott, in uh, Mauritania. A lot of the people that came to Nouakchott settled between the city and the coast, and they're using the sand from the sand dunes in order to build their houses. And this has resulted in a number of the breaches opening into the sand dunes. So this is a case where you've got a combination of rising risks, you know, you've got increasingly unpredictable uh, rain patterns and often very concentrated rain patterns when, when they do occur, which is not that frequent. You've got sea level rise, but you've got an infrastructure that is being built in a way that not only is not protecting the city, but in fact increasing its vulnerability. And of course, all of this will increase with climate change. Now, these are two very complicated graphs, so take my, my word at it that what they're showing to you is that cities across Africa are increasingly at risk of, of flooding, both coastal cities uh, because of sea level rise, but also the, across the continent. Now, one of the big challenges is that African cities are simply not equipped right now to provide that kind, the kind of infrastructure and respond to the needs. They simply do not have access to the kind of financing that is necessary. And there in the bottom, those tiny little squares and rectangles on the bottom represent a, a number of African cities. And what, you, what this tells us is that average, uh, in, average investment or resources available for investments, capital uh, infrastructure investments in African cities varies from six to $45 uh, per person per year. And that's simply an incredibly low amount of money. And you contrast that with South African cities, which have approximately a thousand you know, uh, investments per capita per year, a thousand dollars per capita per year, split between capital and operating expenditures. So to address this, uh, interventions are needed at various levels. One is to increase the, re increase the resources available both as a share of national resources, but also uh, Professor Collier talked about land taxation uh, and the taxation of the rents that are generated by an increase in, in the value of, of housing. But you, having more money is not going to be helpful unless the institutions are built so that a good use is made of that money. And there, uh, Mokhtar talked about the importance of of having building capacity at the local level. And that is certainly something we may really must uh, continue working on. Um, and let me end here. And thank you very much for your attention. Those were three excellent presentations. Please join me to uh, give a big round of applause. It's great to get started. I want to invite our panelists to the stage while I introduce you. And I want you to think about the message of the three. I mean, they all talk about urbanization, but I think the underlying message was of growth. And, and, and traditionally, we have talked about you know, urbanization as a you know, byproduct of growth. And those three are asking us, challenging us, saying, you know, what can cities do for growth? What would we do differently? Th think about your questions. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. We have three very, very distinguished panelists from very different parts of, of professional. Uh, Jean-Pierre Bassi, please, um, is the Secretary General of the United Cities and Local Government Association. You have the responsibility to present all the cities of Africa for this conversation. Um, Abdurrahman Sisse, the Minister of Budget for Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, thank you for being here. And Mukisa Kitui, um, the Secretary General UNCTAD. Um, I would also like to invite our um, speakers here uh, while we get started. Um,
So, um, I think I want to really get started with uh, uh, Mr. Bassi for the for local government. So, if you've heard from all our speakers, it seems to me the local governments have to do a lot. They have to build infrastructure, they have to coordinate, build housing, and overall after that actually collect taxes to build those things. I want to re share with us what your members are saying and what you're hearing from cities. Thank you, for, first of all, for inviting the United Cities and local government to attend this very impressive gathering. And um, thank you to the presenters for insightful information and inspiring um, what we should be observing, taking into account. But this is the day-to-day -day job of local authorities. And this day-to-day -day job is addressed in a way to find solution, not to, not to agonize. Thank you. Of course, you can think uh, this is very harmful because um, you don't know where to start from. But the reality is, for us, very simple. My message here, after having listened to uh, the presentation and your question, I have, let's say, three main messages to bring to this audience. And this is the change of length in the way we see cities in Africa. Message number one, we need to change the perception of cities from the expenditure side of the ledger to the revenue side of the national ledger. Uh, so far, this is not really the case. Message number two, we need to turn local government into partners to work with a constructive and collaborative relationship with national government. And uh, as a representative of local government in Africa, you should know that almost all countries as a national association or local government that you can start dialoguing with in a structured manner. And I can confirm that this is one of the key demand of local authorities in Africa. This structure, constructive, cooperative dialogue with national government. And let's, uh, proposal number three, chain number three, is the understanding that the global length of cities is changing with the anticipated adoption of goal 21, goal 11, not 21, <laughs> goal 11, calling for sustainable cities. And to achieve this global goal, African cities need to be empowered in order to play their rightful role. Uh, so far, we are missing in this dialogue between national and local government, we are missing the voice and the perspective of the ministers in charge of economy, finance, and budget. Therefore, we would like to thank the bank Vice President Maktadiop and this whole team for having convened this meeting. And we see this meeting as a starting point for or a door opener for further interaction between local authorities and the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Economy, and the Minister of Budget. <laughs> and uh, let, allow me hereby to invite the minister present here to be visible at the next Africity Summit. The Africity Summit 
is a gathering of local government of Africa, which is organized every three years. This time it is organized from 29th November to 3rd December in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we want that you take your due place in this uh, gathering so that we can jointly plan how we are going to achieve sustainable cities in Africa. This is my first remark to what I heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you for your comment about Minister of Finance and Budget. We are lucky that we actually have a Minister of Budget among us. And knowing this problem, as you say, you're going to get the most difficult question uh, among us. But let's, let's make this, you heard from three panelists how much more investments required. You heard comparison with other countries. Given that what you've heard today, tell us how you see from the national government, not from your country, but from other countries, and what possibly you would do differently. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm kind of used to be on the spotlight, uh, being a minister of budget. So, um, <laughs> but um, I really appreciate you know, what I've been, uh, what I've been showed uh, earlier by uh, the panelists. So I agree on what I've been said, uh, by the way, mainly on the three main uh, pillars that we need to focus on, particularly housing, infrastructures, and jobs. Uh, what do we do locally? Because there's a difference between uh, theory and being on the ground and try to implement things. So a lot of things have been doing, have been done uh, by uh, governments uh, during, the past, uh, during the past years. Uh, and one of, one of them is basically on the fiscal side. Uh, a lot of people uh, mention uh, land taxation. And it's quite important. It's actually key uh, in order to develop uh, our cities. But it's not easy uh, to do it uh, on the ground uh, because we do have some issues in the way we manage uh, our land and property rights. So one of the main things we need to put a strong uh, emphasis on is property rights management. That will basically help uh, in developing a mortgage uh, market and that will definitely help in you know, financing uh, housing and even financing in general uh, of, um, of the economy. So that's really important. As far as Ivory Coast is concerned, a lot of things have been done uh, in, that, uh, in that area. First thing that we did uh, was basically to put online uh, basically the, the register uh, for, for land so that when you, um, when you uh, actually, I lost my English, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> when you basically, how do we say um, notaire? Oh, uh, uh, lawyer, when the lawyer is <coughs> Register, yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, when you register, you don't need basically to go and, uh, and look for, for, for the paper uh, at you know, the local tax administration. You can go online and see all the information you need about the property you want to, uh, you want to do a transaction on. So that's quite important because it reduces uh, the duration of time uh, you have to, uh, and also all the different procedures. You can go online and do everything. Second thing that we did also was to reduce uh, the duration uh, of time that, uh, that it takes to have uh, the permit uh, to build a house. It used to be more than 300 days uh, to get the permit. Now you can get your permit in less than 90 days, 9-0. Uh, 90 days is still a, a, you know, long, but we'll continue, uh, in the, you know, we continue to reduce uh, that number in order to make sure that uh, that number goes uh, lower and lower. Something that we did also is to set up uh, a one-stop shop whereby you can go and get all the different uh, papers that you need in order to get your permit of, uh, of, you know, of construction. Second thing is on the fiscal side. When you talk about urbanization, you need to make sure that it's actually <coughs> you give incentives uh, for people to actually go from one place to another because you don't want everyone to be into you know, the major cities. And that's something that the President uh, Ouattara uh, understood and uh, the government is actually working on it. So what we decided to do was basically to set up uh, a new fiscal regime uh, whereby we divide the country into three different zones. Uh, zone A, Zone B and Zone C. Zone A is basically where uh, Abidjan, uh, the main city is. And Zone C are basically all the different places where you have less than 60,000 uh, you know, habitants. In Zone C, for example, when you do an investment as, uh, as an investor, you can get 
15 years, one five, 15 years <coughs> of tax exemption of corporate tax. We did it because we want to push companies to go and invest there so that you, know, you can create jobs. Uh, so that are the kind of things that we do in order to uh, make sure that people go into different areas in, uh, in the country. Second thing that we did also was you know, on the infrastructure side. You want to make sure that when you talk about urbanization, you give the basic infrastructure so that people can go uh, into that area. You cannot force people to go into one area. One thing you can do is put the basic infrastructure as you, you know, that was actually uh, mentioned in one of the presentation. Once you have something, people will naturally go there. And that's something where we put a strong emphasis on. Ivory Coast, for example, have a capacity of, in terms of power, of 1,650 uh, megawatts. We want to bring that to 4,000 megawatts by 2020. But at the same time, we want to make sure that all the small areas in the country are electrified. And um, the goal is basically <coughs> to make sure that all the different areas with less than 500 uh, inhabitants uh, are basically, uh, of more than 500 inhabitants, are basically electrified. And we actually have around 1,500 uh, of them. Uh, from 2011 to 2015, we electrified 800 of them. So that's something also quite important that we, uh, that we, uh, that we do. Still, in terms of uh, uh, urbanization, water supply. <laughs> you want to make sure that you know, people go in areas where they have water. And something, just a number for you to, to remember, in every coast still, because that's the country I know the most. Uh, for the past four years, from 2011 to 2015, we bring uh, the quantity of water supply that has been bring, uh, to the pop that has been brought to the population is more than what have been. It's actually kind of the same level that what have been brought during 50 years, from from 1960 to 2011. So in four years, we brought around the same level of water supply to the population that was, what have been brought during the you know the uh, the past. Uh, 50 years. So urbanization is key. We, underst we understand it. Uh, we know there is a long way to go, uh, but we're trying to find uh, the right solution uh, by putting a strong emphasis on housing, uh, infrastructure, and jobs. Housing also, we gave also some incentives uh, for people to build social housing. Because one thing is to build house, but the other thing is to make sure that they're affordable uh, by the population. So if you're a company and you come in Ivory Coast and you build uh, more than 3,000 houses, of which 60, 60 are basically in the range that we define as being social, uh, you basically have a lot of tax exemption. Second thing that we did also to make sure that people build actually some cities, in the past when you have a land and you want to build, uh, and to develop a program, you pay, uh, you pay property tax on uh, the full superficy. Uh, since uh, the 1st of January 2015, uh, we reduced basically that thing by 25%. So you have tax exemption on 25% of the land. Uh, I can go forever, but I'm going to stop I, I, here. I'm because, you'll uh, get a lot of questions. So thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Kidui, Kidui, let's ask two of the president that talked about jobs as, as a main driver, you know, with the jobs are located. Your organization. This is the core thing you talk about, but traditionally people have thought about jobs in a macro sense, you know, national policies, industrial policies. They made a presentation of cities can play a very important role. So we'd like to hear from your organization, Rungtad, how do you see the role of cities in jobs? From the presentations and our own and a sense of what's happening around Africa, actually there's something that is increasingly very strong coming through. One, that if we're talking about sustainable development goals over the next 15 years, and that Africa is home to the largest percentages of absolute poor in the world. And that the poor are voting with their feet towards Africa's towns. The global focal point for sustainable inclusion, inclusive prosperity has to be African towns. So, so this goes beyond uh, a specific segment. This is the eye of the storm of whether we deliver on the ambitions of sustainable development goals or not. Having said that, well, substantial attention has been given to planning delivery of social services, reduce the desperation of life. I think the critical engine for sustaining social growth, social development, is viable livelihoods. 
Now, African cities offer two, three fundamental advantages to the planner. One, proximity reduces the cost of both developmental and social infrastructure. It's much cheaper to deliver with digital inclusion. It's much cheaper to deliver with piped water supply, much cheaper with a modernized sewage system when it's urbanized than when it's dispersed across the continent. Now, how do we build sustainable livelihoods? One, there has been too much emphasis on being close to where the jobs are. I think there should be emphasis on how do we create the jobs. To me, the artisan uh, experiments we have looked at have the potential to be converted into the productive hubs of Africa's urban centers. A number of things are critically important. One, I've just mentioned closing the, the, the digital gap, the infrastructure gap for its communication, for its movement of products and inputs for processing in, the, in those areas of African cities. Number two, and importantly, small enterprises have a very high mortality rate in Africa. So policy interventions that help, for example, to access low-cost credit for small enterprises, which are a major source of livelihood in the urban areas of Africa. Number two, a state transformation in the mentality of seeing the informal not as a threat but as an asset. What do I mean? Globally, my sense of African government is to look at African cities, particularly slums, the domicile of new arrivals, as a threat, as a security challenge, as people beyond control, as people to be contained. Now, a transformation of mentality that this is a potential milk cow for the cities will see greater investment in the human skill of the city residents, which is critical. How do we invest in the confluence of scientific and technological innovation and revival of self-worth among the peripheral city residents of the peripheries of African urban areas? I think every African city must have a plan of turning itself into a knowledge hub of turning those people that are seen as a threat into the asset that creates the value, of reducing the hostility of formalization of informal enterprises, which not only gives you the addresses to which to send services, but also gives you a tax register entry for the people who live in those areas. I think there is no shortcut to knowledge hubs. And how does this work? My organization has been working with African ports. What we do is we do like a mentorship between an efficient port in Europe or in Asia and a series of African ports and say, can you go and see how things are done better? We take the senior management through a program over two years and then they graduate with a diploma of port management on the basis of large experiences. I think we can give new content to twinning of cities today that city managers can learn best practices on how to deliver services, but most importantly, how to optimize the use of the urban residents as an asset by creating a formal info economy, which will be the main source of revenues beyond what they get from the central government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I actually had plans to ask the uh, speakers to comment on it, but I'm very aware of the time. I would really like to open up to question, and I'll get the speaker's ch chance later. Um, and are these questions from online questions? Yeah. Um, while you I actually. So uh, if you have a question, please come to the mic, introduce yourself, and uh, we will get going. I would like to, um, just to give some preference to our online um, audience, I would like to read out one question. One question for online. I'm just choosing uh, uh, from the question. So the question, one of the online questions is a very good, just if you can wait for one second, just stay there, don't go away, uh, otherwise it'll take time. Um, so the question is, why are African countries not building cities where firms are clustered? Why doesn't this happen naturally? Um, Professor Collier, you want to take a stab, hmm? or anyone sure. else? What, cities where? It, the question is, why are African countries not building c cities where firms are clusters? Why is that happening naturally? because it has happened naturally in a lot of other countries. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for clusters to happen, um, land markets have to work. And uh, a lot of the land in African cities 
uh, is not um, subject to proper market processes. It's not uh, legally registered. Um, it can't easily be transacted. Um, and so, uh, so it's much harder for firms to just say, well, where's the sensible place to cluster near uh, where other firms are? Another feature of clustering, um, it doesn't just happen naturally. It happens through infrastructure, appropriate infrastructure being provided before firms make their decisions. And in Africa, you haven't got the, the zones. The, the privilege has tended to be tax sweetheart deals, whereas what it should have been was good clusters of infrastructure. So you coordinate by having properly functioning land markets with early infrastructure around which firms link. And then you get households clustering around those, those firms. You, know, you, you need dense labor markets as well as a cluster. Thank you. Please, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Raymond Kaibeki. I am coming from Sierra Leone. I'm the chief executive officer of the Investment Promotion Agency. Um, it has been a, a, very, a, learning, uh, a learning call for me here this, uh, today when I saw the speakers uh, actually giving their presentations. A um, few things came out, but I failed to see some gaps, which I, I want to ask, probably they can throw light on. Um, clearly, most of the issues raised here are responsibilities of various countries' governments. And I saw a lot of pressure on governments to create uh, roads, jobs, infrastructure, housing, Etc. Etc. What I was not really clear, um, what I did not see coming out clearly, is the role of the private sector in all of this. Um, before I go into that, let me give you a simple scenario. The structure of the educational system in Africa is so skewed to the fact that students graduating year on year, when they graduate every year, they come out looking for jobs. I think we should not look at students coming out creating jobs. And when they come out looking for jobs, the pressure is on governments to provide these jobs. And government is not the best person to provide jobs. The private sector actually provides jobs. And secondly, there's a disjoint between three very important organs in any country. The government, the universities, and then the private sector. I believe the, the, the government is there to set the stage by providing policy reforms that should make business, business thrive. And those reforms should be very much researched by the universities. And when they are researched, business plans are developed by these universities, given to our private sector, and then there's a chain that goes around. But now there's a, there's a disjoint. People in government see those in the universities very differently. And when you're in university, you see a businessman driving in a very fantastic, uh, a flashy car, you see them differently. There's a topsy-topic situation between these people that, um, well, you are talking about PhDs, I am talking about elitist Bentley. So they see themselves as uh, at par. Um, yeah, uh, in closing, I, I actually want to see a situation wherein we can go back to our educational systems and change the fact that we have to teach our people, our kids, financial education, money education, and tax education, because you send your children to school is for them to be rich people at the end of the day to get money. You said that is, that is it, that go to school, get the best education, get the best universities, get the best jobs, and at the end of the day, get money. And when you get to these companies to get money, you meet people they already had a job. So why not create these jobs so that you can actually provide jobs rather than searching for jobs? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, sir, uh, if you can just focus on the question so we can have some time for the answers. My name is Obed Ligate. I'm an independent researcher. I live in the United States. I'm originally from Tanzania. Um, my question is um, about stemming this problem of urbanization. 30% um, 30 uh, 30 of the population in sub-Saharan Africa lives in town, roughly. 70 to 80% live in rural areas. Um, I think the discussion should shift to create employment in the rural areas, uh, the informality, make it formalize, uh, we formalize the informality, and uh, create agribusinesses and concentrate on creating employment in where most of the people are. Um, that will have also a, a two-pronged, um, will, will decrease the um, social inequality too. And I think we should be discussing that area. And I'm just uh, posing that question to the, the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Let me take in one more question and then we'll come back to you. Um, please. Hello, my name is Malele Chango. I'm working with the World Bank Africa region. So from my understanding, Africa is not only growing rapidly, it's also growing younger with 65% of the population being youth. So my question is, how does our gender and urbanization relate to the demographic dividend and how can we include um, youth to be a part of our growth in the cities? All right. So there's one more because we're going to run out of Please go ahead okay, and then we'll you. ask the panel to have a chance to respond. Thank you. I'm Emmanuel Kambi. Uh, I'm working for Sawaikon. I'm an urban specialist. I would like to know regarding Africa, what is, what are the national, what is the government thinking of urbanization to include it as a national goal? Because every time I present myself that I'm speaking of urbanization, especially to my counterparts, they tell me, what about towns? Or in French, les villes, en ville. So what are the goals, what is the government thinking of putting it as a prime goal as we are getting to the 2015 SDGs. Thank you. All right, so, um, so just I would just ask all of you to respond to the question. You don't have to respond to all of them. The questions was very clearly about private sector, the role of private sector, um, uh, the role of rural em employment, uh, the role of youth. And I must point out there's one very interesting question from our online audience, how can Urban Action address poverty enable better education for youth? So this is a consistent question. So, um, Mr. Cesar, shall we start with you? Uh, let's start by another one. Just okay. okay. <laughs> I can leave. Yeah, you go ahead. Yes, um, the lady from the, the, the World Bank. If Africa's population bulge is to be a demographic dividend and not a demographic curse, we have to address how do we add value to the lives of young Africans. And to me, it's not just knowing how to trade, but creating the structural transformation that you know, continuously improves the quality and competitiveness of made in Africa. This is why I was speaking about the confluence of scientific and technological innovation and the policy setting that builds on the competence of the private sector. If Africa is going to offer leadership as the rest of the world's population grace, we cannot do that by keeping a septic environment whose people only go to the rest of the world as the victims of Lampedusa. And that is to be addressed at the policy level in, 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 in our cities. On the question of private sector, yes, the main absorber of scientific innovations for improved productivity. If Africa is to have a greater role in the international trade of tasks and goods, global value chains, is going to how do we prime up Africa's private sector? Access to credit, fair regulative uh, environment, less state hostility, predictable investment environment. And last, for the Tanzanian gentleman, or the formerly Tanzanian. I think we have to deal with what is more than what we would have liked to be. What we would have liked to be is create conditions of prosperity and increase, increase structural transformation in the rural areas, mainly by improved productivity of the agricultural sector and delivery of social services and economic infrastructure in the rural areas. What is, is rapidly the unemployed voting with their feet to the cities. Now we have to deal with how do we extract the best productivity out of them in their new setting. And that's why the policy in the cities matter but does not exclude sound policy in the rural areas as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Masi? Yeah, I don't like this divide between rural and urban. We, at the local level, local government level, we deal with people where they live. And uh, the response is to try and build the territorial continuum where people at, are at ease and where they can improve the capacity to uh, produce wealth and improve their own living conditions. What is striking is that many countries tend not to understand the local context. So you build national policies that you expect to run from north to south the same way. This is what, as local authorities, we want to educate our national government to understand that we understand their search for unity. 
But they should understand our, uh, uh, our firm con conviction of the respect to diversity. And, and, and this, you do that if you respect human rights, the liberty of moving, going and, and, and coming, and the capacity to govern yourself. And this is why we call for more decentralization. Because if people can um, master the way they want to live in their areas, then if you have a conversation with national government, they will understand that we need national unity, and the national government will understand that we need a diverse way of implementing our national policies. This is my first response to, to this divide between rural and urban. We don't like this divide. My second response on the dividend, the demographic dividend. The demographic dividend, we can lose it. If you don't get politics, uh, the, the, the policies right. Uh, most of the people are saying the next, the next century was, will be the African century because we will be the bulk of the demographic uh, weight of this world. But if you pose the question to the young people of Africa, they will tell you then desperation will be there for, for long. And this is that they are flying away from Africa because they think that the future is not in Africa. To reverse this, you need to create, first of all, a kind of self-esteem. This kind of self-esteem means that you need to reverse the way you call things. I don't like you calling people that are small entrepreneurs in formal sector. What is this? Go to America. All the small sellers are taxpayers and entrepreneurs. You don't call them informal. Why do you call them informal in Africa? So change, first of all, your language so that people can have self-esteem. And through self-esteem and dignity, they will fight for more autonomy and more uh, contribution to the wealth of their countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wondered, Ede, uh, Paul, or Marin, did you want to react to the question, or Mrs. Issa? Just, I, I really wanted to pick up this, this again on the question from the gentleman from Tanzania about why don't we shift to creating employment in rural areas. And, and I want to echo what others have said before me, which is it's not either or. We need both. Right? If, if you have a very unbalanced growth and you concentrate all your resources in, in, in the cities and put nothing in the rural areas, well, the people, who will, people will move to the cities, but they will move to the cities in acts of desperation, typically with limited education, human capital, and so on and so forth. What you want to see is a process of urbanization that is one that, that is conducive to creating wealth, where you've got prosperity in the countryside that enables you know, families to not have everybody working on the farm, but enables people to send some members of their family to the cities for education and so on and so forth. So it's really not either or. You want to have both. And it's also important to realize that some some parts of Africa, some rural parts of Africa, are simply likely to not be very sustainable in the future. There are parts that are really running out of water, or where, where resources, water resources, are just too unpredictable to make it possible to have a, a, a good life. So, you know, maybe concentrate some of the resources where there is a potential, and that's some areas and some rural areas and some urban areas. So, I think it's really critical that we have a balanced growth path between the two. Yeah, just wanted to add something on um, on the question regarding the private sector. Uh, we all agree uh, it's the private sector to um, you know the private sector has to play a role, but the government needs to create the condition for the private sector to uh, to jump in, and that's basically what major African countries are basically trying to do. Uh, regarding uh, job creation for for the youth, uh, it's basically something quite important, and all the African countries are basically working on that. I think the main issue on that is basically ad adequation between demand and offer. We need to make sure that uh, degrees are related to 
what is actually needed on the ground. So it's basically something that we need to work on uh, to make sure that when people graduate from universities, they actually see the offer you know, on the market to, uh, to, find, to find actually jobs. Just to, f just to finish on my side, actually, regarding the financing, I think the mortgage market is really important. And uh, land property registration is key uh, to make that happen. Thank you. Um, if, are there any more questions? One more, maybe this is the last one. I'm very uh, cognizant of the time and respectful of your time. It's, so this will be the last question. And then I will give each one of you a chance to say one message that you have that people to walk away from. So if you want to think about that, please, sir. Hello. Uh, I greet you all. Uh, I didn't want to speak because uh, I come from a different world. I'm a politician, I'm a member of parliament. But it's as if we're not listening well, or you're not telling us, uh, uh, you're not direct in, in, in your questions. I think when I heard the professor say, it's as if he's saying, you have, Africa, you have no any other way of developing your cities apart from planning them, so that they can be globalized. If you have an old city, create a new planned city. Please, that's what he's saying. That's what the professor is saying to match the global markets. We cannot Im invite investors, I'm from Uganda, you cannot invest, uh, invite investors to come from Europe and go on to invest in the middle of the slums. So it's no longer possible. And why are we people running away from Africa? They are running away from a disorganized place to come to a formalized planned place. That's all. So are we not getting it right? Are we, are we not hearing? Why are we trying to circumvent, say, then take services? I mean, you can't take services to every, everybody wherever they are. There's no, there's no government that can manage that. And secondly, the gentleman from the minister from the budget place uh, department, please, you must begin to budget for cities as you budget for agriculture and as you budget for defense. That's the only way. Why are you saying we shall bring the water? Where? Where shall we bring the water? Under whose house? Which is not planned. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I don't know why you were waiting for your question for so long. Thank you very much. All right. So the question was that, Professor Collier, that people seem to have heard that you're suggesting we should build new cities. Uh, and argument that existing cities are very difficult to retrofit. That's not the solution. So I'm going to ask both of you, so Professor Collier first. Yeah, I think that's broadly right, that um, two-thirds of Africa's urban population uh, by 2050 isn't yet in cities. And so two-thirds of Africa's cities are still to be built. Let's build them right. It's easier, it's cheaper to get them right initially than to retrofit. Um, after mistakes. Um, should everything be a priority? Rural, urban, you know, this, that. If everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. The point about priorities is tough choices. Get serious. The cities need big investment. They need a big change in policies. That's a vital matter. Where are Africa's young people going to live? They're going to live in cities. What's the distinctive feature about young people? What is Africa's demographic dividend? It's that young people are particularly good at change. That's youth's skill, the ability to change, to accept change. Change happens when that, that is what drives productivity growth. And the engine of that happens in cities, not on farms. It's an urban process. Youth is an urban advantage. If you leave it in rural areas, it, you, you won't get your demographic dividend. Let me just turn finally to um, Sierra Leone. And you, there's a very good question, what is the role of the private sector? Well, the key private sector you need in, in Sierra Leone doesn't exist, right? It's, it's, the, it's the firms that, is, as somebody said, are not going to come in and locate in Sierra Leone with Sierra Leone what it's like now. Let me there is another private sector, though, which is households investing in housing. 
And that can't happen well in Sierra Leone because there's completely confused property rights. And so start by cleaning up the property rights to land. Thank you. I'm sorry, can I, uh, I've been resisting asking a question myself, but just want to, I want to make sure I heard you were right. Are you actually proposing that Africa should uh, pursue a policy of greenfield cities or existing cities? The historical evidence of greenfield cities are very mixed, actually very poor. I think what is, what is actually needed in Africa is, is satellite cities. It's satellites just outside. So you, the city, you, know, you take a city like Dar es Salaam, at the moment it's five million. By 2050, it'll be 15 million. Where are those 10 million people going to live? Are they just going to squash further into the slums? Right? The way to do that is to expand Dar, uh, and uh, right. close to Dar, but an expanded, more efficient Dar. Mr. Bassi, I'm sure you're chomping to respond to that. I'm, I have mixed feeling. Because what I'm hearing is scary. Can you tell me, I don't know if there is a, someone from DRC here. Can you tell me when the city of Kinshasa will have the capacity to build a network sewage system that will cover the whole Kinshasa? This means what? This means that you have to reflect on the technological packages for African cities. That cannot be the same that the ones that you build for dense cities like Barcelona. If you say that one day uh, Kinshasa will be like Barcelona, you get it wrong. So my feeling is that, yes, we have to mobilize our scientific community. But to question the way we copy what is being implemented as solution, which are not reliable for African cities of tomorrow. Yeah, that, that, that's very, very clear. And for me, uh, when we pose the question of building new cities, retrofitting, uh, people will tell you on the ground, or in Dar es Salaam, they will tell you, OK, uh, in, in 50 years maybe, but today, please, improve my living condition where I am. And it is possible, if you consider people as an asset, build with the people. And this is what we try to do. We try to organize uh, uh, cities, first of all, leaders of cities, to know their cities, to say that uh, people are the first asset of the cities. And not to undermine the slum dwellers, but to get them part of the solution. And we are organized with uh, uh, Slum Dwellers International, a campaign saying we should be working together to try and find a solution to improve a little bit the living condition of the people. Dreaming of uh, Dubai on, uh, on the Gulf of Guinea, or Dubai on the river of Congo, well, it can be, but uh, going global or global cities has a huge cost socially. So what we want to do is to say, given the climate change that is occurring, please find a different path in developing African cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm just going to give one minute to each of you. We are actually 10 minutes beyond time already to give our audience one message that we want them to remember. So please, Marin, we'll go from the third back. To echo the, the message that it's easier and cheaper to do it right the first time around. And, and the challenge is, I think we've talked about two dimensions of the challenge, the resources available, but then also all the rules and regulations that are there that are standing in the way. The financing challenge is a very challenging one, and it's, it's going to be very difficult to resolve in the short term. But there are so many low-hanging fruit in terms of the rules and regulation, and so many things that can't be that difficult to fix, that don't cost a lot of money and don't require deep technical expertise. So I think by addressing some of these as urgently as possible, a lot of progress could be made in the lives of many, and I would focus on that first. Thanks, Mary. This is one minute. 
So regulation, so the government has to create the right environment for the private sector to invest, to invest into all the different cities uh, in the different countries. So that's one. Second thing, as I said, property right, land property right is key, and we need to really stress on that. And third one is the work between the local government and the central government. But people need to pay attention to what the local governments are doing, because we can't, there's always the debate between the local and the central. Uh, can the local go and raise money and have loans? These are things that we need to keep a strong eye on. The future of Africa as a whole, and Africa cities in particular, is critically dependent on structural transformation. The structural transformation we're talking about is not only a regulatory environment, but facilitating a virtuous growth through improved productivity, greater innovation, and rising up the value in the global value chains. This requires a constant investment in a knowledge economy. And constantly, if we're going to see Africa rise, it is going to rise because of a knowledge intensive trade whether it is in services or in manufactured products or in value-added agricultural products. And I see the cities as a perfect hub in which policy has to be coherent between technical, economic, and trade policies and industrial policies. So the resurgence of the developmental state, the end of laissez fair that things the liberal market will work on its own has to coincide with purposeful action that sees the African entrepreneur as a critical resource. Not the foreign investor that you're talking about attracting. Create the conditions for the local investor and the foreign investor will come because of the profit the African is making. Well, I dare going into an area that I'm not uh, supposed to be expert of. This is what I call the fiscal transition in Africa. And I, I talk to the Minister of Budget Minister of Finance, that we are signing agreement in the Doha round, saying that we should be sealing the custom right so that we can boost trade. Most of African countries, as the part of their money is coming from the custom rights, if they are sealed, then you need a fiscal transition. In that case, internal, and you said it, internal fiscality should be taxation, should be the bulk of your public money. Therefore, you need to team up with local government and rely on them. They are as uh, patriotic as you can be. And count on them, if you team up right, to make this fiscal transition right. Thank you. Professor Kuli, one thing you want us to remember. I want to reiterate something that Esther Mbassi said when he first spoke, which is that um, federal, central government needs to take cities seriously. And I think that is, the, the, to my mind, the real message that needs to come out of here, that I want ministers of finance and ministers of the economy to think, what could we do differently that would transform cities? If I was a minister of finance in Africa and I'd heard all this, I'd say, I need a task force to rethink our urban policy and to rethink how we're going to finance it. We're going to build a tax system which harnesses the rents from land appreciation and which finances the big infrastructure investments that we need. I will dismantle those regulations that stand in the way of affordable housing and that stand in the way of the, of the clusters of firms that would provide a lot of jobs. That's what I would do. Thank you. Okay. No city in the world, no country in the world has moved from low income status to middle income status to high income status without urbanizing. Dispersed rural populations, large dispersed urban populations are a blockage of development. Many countries think of urbanization as a subproduct of development. What we're saying here is that urbanization is the key ingredient for development. It is a necessary condition, but however, it's not sufficient. 
really looking at the opportunities of having cities that work. Cities that work as cities, as entities and organizations, but also cities that have the jobs for the residents to work is fundamental. And Africa is at a stage of urbanization that can get it right, that can look at where, where the mistakes of other countries and avoid them. And therefore, the message for you is that you can think of urbanization as a subproduct, will grow economically, yes, will urbanize, but uh, the main message is that urbanization is the key element of growth, and it's also the key element to lift the entire population and entire countries out of poverty. That's the main message. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, from my side, from listening to all these people, you know, um, I think what Ere said in this presentation, we have to get cities right. And for all of us, I think, uh, who are here and all of us who work are interested in this, I think this is not only an opportunity to get it right, but I think it's a responsibility to get it right. So thank you very much. Thank you for this fantastic panel. Uh, please join me to give your hand.